This is the show that helps you know what to quit, what to keep, and what to question. Welcome to the QuitCast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the QuitCast. Last week, we talked about why am I not writing the difference between stuck, blocked, and burned out. We kind of focused on the stuck part last week. And if you haven't listened to that one, I would encourage you to go back uh, and start there. We're going to do block today, which of course there's a difference between being stuck, being blocked and being burned out. And we want to illustrate today what the block part is. Uh, We've done a whole series on writer's block and we'll put the link in the show notes. If you want to go back and look at all of the different ways that we talk about writer's block and what that looks like, like there's this mythology around writer's block uh, in the writing community that it's such a bad thing and that you shouldn't get it. But actually writer's block can be really productive. Of course, the, the, common colloquialism, I think, of writer's block uh, is that it's something that a lot of highly driven writers use as a way to try to shame writers who are not driven into getting out and stopping thinking. And of course, if you've been around the quick cast at all, you know that we do not shame writers for thinking because thinking can be really productive. And for those of us who are wired naturally to need to think a lot, you know, the archetype of the bread maker, right? Or Um, For those of us who are really into DISC or uh, Myers-Briggs or StrengthsFinder, there are certain personality types that like to think more. There's even like a part of the Myers-Briggs that's called thinking. So I don't know why we have this idea in the writing community that somehow I should just stop thinking and just start writing, that somehow thinking and writing are unrelated to each other. But the blocked part, remember we're talking about the car in the garage and you have the Uh, The driving around is essentially utilizing the creativity. And when you get stuck, like if you're stuck in the mud or stuck in the snow, um, then you just need like to get out, right? Like you just need to sort of pull yourself out of that place. And there are places where when you're stuck, it's very easy to just kind of, you know, roll your tires a little bit or call a tow truck. And it's just that simple, right? Being blocked is slightly different because usually when you're blocked, There's a way that your brain is trying to help you figure out what you need to get the story moving again, but there's often something that has happened that's out of your control that's making the block happen. So again, using the car metaphor, those of you who've ever been in Los Angeles, if you've ever seen some of the interchanges in Los Angeles where the traffic is literally stopped, like there's something that's blocking the way and you have no control over that block. And we need to work on the block itself in order to get you unblocked. Because for us, it isn't just about the manuscript. Um, That's often the stuck place. Like often stickiness or stuckness is about there's something in the manuscript that we just need to figure out. But being blocked is very different to me. Uh, That means that there's a creativity piece that's not able to be working. So let's talk a little bit about what the different types of being blocked are and how you might be able to get your creativity car moving again. And then of course, next week, we're gonna talk about uh, the difference between stuck block and burned out in terms of what does the burnout part look like. Uh, So tune in next week for that. But today let's talk a little bit about being blocked. So let's try to disconnect our understanding of quote unquote writer's block. However, you've heard people define that before, and focus specifically on, I'm not writing because something is blocking me or blocking my creativity. It's important to understand the similarity between the traffic being blocked ahead of me and the actual block that can happen. So let's talk about what that looks like. First type of block is called pressure block. And remember last time we talked about how sometimes there was a no pressure stuck right? Where there wasn't enough pressure. And so you weren't able to move forward um, because you couldn't create pressure yourself and you needed that pressure. Well, sometimes it's possible. And again, this is something that you don't have control over. So it's important to understand how to recognize and get out of this place because it's usually not something that you've chosen about yourself. It's usually something that either has happened to you or is going on in your brain. But pressure block is when there's so much pressure 
that your creativity is literally not able to function because your fight or flight mode gets kicked in so quickly. And if you've heard me talk about fight or flight mode before, I mean, obviously many of us have heard other people talk about fight or flight, but I specifically like to use the metaphor of the lion at the mouth of the cave, because to me, I think all of us can understand if I'm just sitting around in a cave, like making a fire and all of a sudden I see a lion at the mouth of the cave, I understand that I was safe and calm and fine. And now there's a dangerous predator at the mouth of the cave and I can't get out of the cave because of it. So what am I going to do? I'm either going to freeze because I'm scared and I don't want it to notice me. And I figure if I can make myself small, then the threat will go away. Right. Or I'm going to fly. Like I'm going to, um, run or I'm going to fight. So if I can fight the lion, then I do. And if I can't, then I freeze. So when there's too much pressure on, on whatever it is on me to produce something perfect, too much pressure on me to make sure I don't make mistakes or that I get something done when I keep missing deadlines where we see this happen a lot. And especially in the last year and a half, in the last 18 months, we've seen a lot of people miss deadlines and then the deadlines sort of compound on them, right? Like I've either done something where I promised some people something, uh, and then I missed the first deadline and then I missed the second deadline. And now I'm at the third or fourth or 15th, right? And I'm still trying to finish everything that I've missed in the deadline that I just, instead of just focusing on the first thing, right? I go into fight or flight mode because I'm so scared of what will happen that I don't realize that the worst has already happened. Like I've already missed the deadline. I've already not delivered the thing, whatever it is that I was the most afraid of has already happened, but I'm so scared of whatever it is that the outcome is that I continue to not be able to work. And this is a place where too much pressure often comes with like a high compliance personality. If you're in the disc, uh, it can come with a high responsibility uh, personality. If you're in the strengths finder, uh, Clifton strengths. So there are a lot of places this can come from, but we do see it being very personality related where I said I would give someone something and then I didn't. And now there's so much pressure because I've missed things or because they've been, things have been added on to me and I didn't realize they had been like, we just see a lot of pressure block happening when I am so afraid of the outcome. And then on top of that, I keep piling these additional expectations. It's like there's too, it's like it's, it really is too much pressure. And we don't always recognize this in ourselves because when we are assuming that we can meet this pressure, it feels reasonable to us. It's like, well, of course, I mean, I missed those first two deadlines, but shouldn't I be able to get it all done at once for this next deadline? Of course I should, right? And especially because we often discount the fact that we're frozen because of the pressure and we assume, oh, I have eight hours every day, or I have seven or six or five or two hours every day. I should be able to just sit down at the manuscript and do this, 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 and this. Um, and then ma'am, 2000 2, words a day for seven days and I could get it all done. Right. Or I assume 10,000 words a day for seven days. Isn't it possible to do 10,000 words a day? And then I lose myself in that pressure to try to do everything and catch everything and meet all the deadlines and also to ignore the frozen situation because it's often that I will freeze even opening the manuscript. So when I'm telling myself, oh, it's only 2000 words a day for the next seven days, I say that in the moment, but when I actually go and try and open the manuscript, I can't even get the manuscript open. And so again, I know we did this last time, but we're probably going to do this every time. I literally want you just when you're sitting here with the sound of my voice to just go and open your manuscript right now. It's not a lion. It's fine. Just go open it and get it open and get over that threshold of the fear. You don't have to write anything in it. If you don't want to, you don't even have to read it. But if you want to take the next step after that, go to where the cursor is supposed to be that you're supposed to move forward and just reread the stuff that you've written and see what comes to you. And that, that for me is the 
I need to take away the fear that happens. That may not be the way to do it though. If you are experiencing major fear or major freeze, you may have to actually get some coaching or go to therapy or do something to deconstruct the fear of what might happen because there's some outcome that you're so afraid of that you're seeing it as the lion at the mouth of the cave and it's making you freeze and there's too much pressure, right? So when you're pressure blocked, you're going to fight, flight, or freeze with the manuscript. And that's something that you can't just will your way through if this happens to you. You don't have the skills to do that right now. So we need to either acquire the skills to do that, which is possible, but it's difficult, right? But it is possible, or we have to disconnect that fear somehow. And so disconnecting the fear of what might happen um, you know, the worst case scenario um, thought sometimes can help of like, well, what happens if uh, I never write another book in this series again? What happens if I just can't make myself write it? Well, your readers will be fine. Like they'll forgive you. They'll come back. They'll keep, or you'll find new readers, right? Like you have a long career ahead of you. So there's a lot of this deconstructing of fear that has to happen when there's too much of a pressure block. If it's the whole, uh, because there are multiple different um, scenarios this could happen in. If it's the whole, um, my last release was so great and I can't not fail then I can't not fail becomes the pressure freeze. And then all of a sudden we're back into fight or flight mode again. So I highly recommend if you're having that block, that genuine pressure block, and it's keeping you from writing, you really do need to talk to someone about that. I always suggest our coaches because of course we all do uh, strengths work and I find it faster with, um, with the Clifton Strengths Assessment. I find it faster to figure out what's really going on with people, but you can talk to a lot of different coaches. You can talk to a therapist. Sometimes a writer friend will help um, if they genuinely know you and your personality and have your best interests at heart, that can absolutely happen. Um, but definitely don't try to tackle this block on your own. This is a big one. And just telling yourself how badly you want it or how easy it would be is not going to help. You definitely have to deconstruct that fear because you're literally a biological time bomb. Every time you think about opening the manuscript, it's just going to set off that fight, flight, or freeze again. So we have to get around that. The second type of block uh, that we discuss is called fallow block, fallow, F-A-L-L-O-W. And if you're not into agriculture or you've never lived on a farm or visited a farm and you don't know what fallow means, essentially leaving a field fallow is the process of allowing it to re-energize itself by staying dormant. Uh, for a season. It lets the nutrients come back into the soil. Um, it lets the soil essentially get ready to receive the crop again. Um, and I do think that there are many of us, and especially those of us who fall into the bread machine style of thinking, where we really need to put everything in the brain and go off and think about it and let ourselves process in the subconscious before we can really write. Um, if you are a fallow block person, your brain is going to take the time that it needs, whether you agree to give it to it or not. And so it can be better to just listen to the fallow block and let it happen. So when you leave a field fallow as a farmer, the reason you do that is for the longevity of the field. Like you want the field to plant uh, you want to be able to plant and receive crop from that field for a long time. And if you continue to do a crop year after year, what they found, especially in certain areas of the country, and again, I'm familiar with the United States of Canada, but um, is that the, the process of farming drains the fields if you do it too often. Um, and so they have this fallow field rotation and you can see the checkerboard, right? If you ever fly over the middle of the country, uh, you can see that some fields are are always brown, uh, even when the other fields are green or gold, um, or you know, full of other crops as well. Um, but there are some fields that every year it'll switch back and forth because, or you know, depending on how you do crop rotation. Um, but the point is to try to allow the field to regain its nutrients. And this means that for those of us who expel everything into a book when we write, we need the fallow time. There's a reason 
that many of us can't just pick up and start a book right after we finish a book. And it's because our brain needs the fallow time to gather all of the nutrients that it needs to gather in order to get back into the process of being able to produce a book. And we misunderstand fundamentally our brain when we assume that I should just be able to write every single day and never ever need any fallow periods at all. Most of us, and if you're familiar with the Clifton strengths, it's the green dominant strengths, right? The, the strategic thinkings, ones that need to utilize our brain in order to do good work. Like many of us um, who are strategic thinking dominant, we need those fallow times so that we can write better books. And I feel like we have a misunderstanding about what it means to procrastinate. And again, if you haven't watched our procrastination is bad, uh, QTP episode, question the premise episode, um, or listen to it, I highly recommend doing that because there is a very important part that procrastination, quote unquote, can play in our fallowness when we have one of those brains that really does need the fallow fields. If you are frustrated by this, it's okay to be frustrated. I don't like the fact that I have to take off a certain amount of time in between books. And it does change depending on like how big the book was or how much it required of me, um, how much of my intellectual brain it used, right? There is definitely a difference uh, with each person, but some of us need quite a long fallow period. Uh, we have some clients who spend months in the fallow, in the fallow field period. And they are fallow blocked, but they don't think of it as block like writer's block. It's more like this is the time that I recharge my batteries or refill my well or fallow my field or whatever it is that we're going to use as a metaphor. But if you are this kind of person, we want to make sure to do the fallow fields uh, part of our writing life in as effective a way as possible, which often means that we have to allow ourselves to do some procrastinating behavior and stop shaming each other for procrastination. Like somehow I should just be able to produce words 24 hours a day, like some kind of widget. It just doesn't work that way. Most people are not able to write like that. There are people who can, and to those who can, awesome, great, wonderful, but that doesn't mean that everyone should. Most of us need some kind of fallow fields. And when you have this type of block that you consistently get into, you will have it regularly. So I would almost plan for that fallow field block to happen when you finish a book. So the third type of block is called plot block. And this for me is different than the plot stuff, which I can usually get out of by just talking to somebody or rereading a piece of the book or something like that. Plot block tends to happen when there's either too many options in the plotting that I'm not able to collapse the scaffolding of the plot on my own and try to be more linear. And this often happens with strategic and with ideation where I legitimately have too much in front of me or too much in my head uh, to be able to really see the plot effectively. And this often leads to something like overwhelm. Um, and typically with plot block, there is a, I guess I would call it a statute, right? Like there's definitely an expectation for each of us that our plot block, if we get this regularly, will happen in the same way. Um, it's almost like the exact same part of the story, the exact same length of time. It doesn't matter. It, it feels like there's a consistency with an awful lot of people who get this plot block. And what often happens is either um, there are too many characters or there are too many potential plot options, or I'm looking too hard to find the absolute best twist that I can find. And some of us actually do okay with the plot block because we eventually figure it out on our own if we let ourselves sit in it long enough. But some of us really do need help with this, especially those of us who are external processors. So I'm going to say when you get plot blocked, and it actually is something about the plot itself, you usually have that overwhelmed feeling like there's too many future options, or I'm not sure which is the best one, or is this twisty enough, that type of thing, which we'll talk about also in a second. But there's generally a feeling of 
heaviness or weight or overwhelm that I literally have to walk away because I just can't think about it. And usually the plot block is something that we have to, and again, I hate this metaphor uh, because it frustrates me as well that it's not predictable, but with plot block, you often do just have to walk away and let it percolate until you figure it out. Um, everybody figures this plot block thing out a little bit differently. If you got the stuck list from last time, um, and I'll put that in the show notes this time as well. But if you got the stuck list workbook from last week, one of the things we encourage you to do is to go back into the books that you've written in the past and look at where you've gotten stuck. And then how did it happen? Uh, how did you get out of it? Right. How did you solve the problem? Because with the plot block, sometimes there are uh, patterns to the way that you do this, like me personally with my high connectedness um, and high strategic, I tend to proliferate uh, people, which proliferates subplots, which makes everything really complicated. And at some point I do reach like a tipping point where I can't actually hold it all in my head. And I usually either have to back up and take out a subplot or I have to back up and take out a character or something like that. And I write mysteries. So that's part of why that happens. Too many red herrings, right? Um, but almost every mystery book that I've ever written, with the exception of the first one, but almost every mystery book I've ever written, I've had the same exact thing happen. And so as I talk to other writers, I start asking them, like, what are your patterns? Look at how you've gotten unstuck in the past. How has this worked? Because the way that you are successful has clues in your past. And we have to make sure to go back and look at how have I done this in the past. And if you consistently get su are successful in getting out of this, because you go back and like reread the whole manuscript or you, you know, take a week off and go to the lake and just walk around the lake. I don't know. Everybody's different, right? But we just want to acknowledge the fact that there are often patterns to the way that we get unstuck from these places because the block is coming from something that's really strong about our brain. So again, I'm, I'm encouraging us to fill out the stuck list workbook if we haven't yet, but if you would rather not do something like a workbook, just go back to the books that you have written, look at how you've gotten stuck and how you've gotten unstuck, and then plan to make that thing that got you unstuck be the thing that you do the next time you get blocked. The last type of block we're going to discuss today is called board block, B-O-R-E-D, being bored, like I'm so bored. Uh, the reason that this is one of the big blocks is because there are particular types of brains that very quickly get bored with their own stories. And they see that somehow as evidence that the story itself can't be good. Because what do we hear the most often about boredness in the middle of the manuscript? We hear, if you're bored, they're bored, right? Like that's so often what we hear about boredness as writers, but that's not always true. Many of us are just wired with a different threshold of boredom than others, especially those of us who in strengths finder language have ideation or individualization or sometimes activator as well, right? We will just naturally get bored quicker, even with our own stuff, especially with our own stuff on like repeat readings. Uh, we will often get bored quicker than your quote unquote average writer or people who don't have strengths like that. And so just being conscious of the fact that I have a higher threshold of excitement and a lower threshold of how fast do I get bored, right? very quickly. And if I am like that, then when I get board blocked, sometimes the best thing to do is to push myself through it. This is the one place where I will sometimes encourage writers to just push because that mantra that we tell ourselves about if I'm bored, then the reader's bored as well. If you're a person who regularly gets bored with everything, that that's not true. You have a lower threshold of what is boring and what isn't. And sometimes that is the most important thing you can know about yourself because it means that you don't have to try for every single moment of the book to be so fascinating to you. Again, it's about how fascinating is it to you that you can't just push yourself through sometimes. I always encourage people who have regular board block to have readers who read their stuff that can tell them if it's boring or not, because typically the person who has that low threshold of like, is it bored? Is it boring? Am I bored? Then they get that very quick place of like, yes, I'm completely bored with this. Most people's threshold is significantly higher than that. And knowing that about yourself can help you to not get so blocked in that place. 
Well, those are the four main types of being blocked that we see. And again, so much of it is about the way our brain works. And there are things we just can't know for ourselves. And I do think it's important. Like I always encourage that people utilize as many different kinds of personality tests as they can and look at the way those different personality types, like the four types or the 16 types or the nine types or the 25, 34, I don't care how many types there are. Um, my main point is that you have to utilize those results to look at what makes me different from other people and why might this be happening to me because of the way that my brain is wired in a way that it doesn't happen to other people or that what happens to other people doesn't happen to me, right? So it's so important to understand that so we don't hold ourselves accountable for other people's results especially because there are so many things in this industry that you have to question the premise of just because the people for whom it works or doesn't work are so different from you. And that is, again, I'm going to push you back towards watching the QTP episodes of the quick cast. If you haven't seen them before, um, please do go take a look at those. Cause I think those are really important for writers. We're going to do some more of them, but the first thing is I want to get through these. Why am I not writing and why am I not selling uh, quick casts? And so this week we did blocked next week. We're going to do burned out. I promise it'll be very fast. So we don't have to stay in that very long. And then we're going to move on to why am I not selling? So I hope that you all have enjoyed this today. Uh, please like subscribe, share, help other writers out by pa passing this along. If you think it would be helpful, uh, join us on our Patreon. We're going to do a couple of really exciting things with our success archetypes this month. Uh, and so I hope you will enjoy that. We will also be doing the clubhouse author platform audits every Tuesday morning. It'll at least be Crystal and I. We're hoping to have some mystery guests in the future. Uh, we have Chris Syme from the Smarty Pants Book Marketing Podcast with us this Tuesday, and we're really excited about that. And again, if you go to writebetterfaster.club, there's a form there that you can fill out uh, to get your platform audited in whatever way you need. So we look forward to seeing you then. I hope everybody has a great day and thank you so much for watching uh, or listening to the quick cast this week and we'll see you next time. Bye everybody. Bye.